Okay, so now let's get again into the role. Battle of integration is always an internal battle. The real soul is where the battle is fought. The real history is determined by the battle of the soul. The whole purpose of history is so that these souls can be developed. And everything else that's happening is, as it were, condimental or is designed to support what my pastor liked to call logistical grace. It's designed to support this. Now, in point of fact, it ends up being that because most Christians um, basically abdicate in the spiritual life, that the provision that's made available for the battle of the soul to actually reach maturity is sort of like shifts around. Kind of like Isaiah 53, 12, where the whole of the booty, the people, is shared out amongst the great ones. So even in this life, and it's not something you can see or know, it's absolutely not political, that God sort of like deploys the growing believer around other believers for the sake of being um that believer being trained, but also for the sake of the other believers who aren't growing, so that he can justify blessing them, because they've said no to him. Okay, this is really important to understand. Wherever it is you are, God is deploying you. And if you're growing, you need to know that it's, how do I want to put this? They're there for you, and they're benefiting for that reason. See, because you're the king. I'm a king. I'm a king. You have to keep adjusting to this. It's a really hard thing to want to do. They're there for your sake. If you do not come to grips with your responsibility and your role, you are a curse to your nation. Each one of us is supposed to be like this. But in point of fact, in actual history, we abdicate. So... The actual growing crop of believers, like Christ said, is like only 3% or 1.5% or 1% in the seed parable. Okay? 30-fold means 3%. 60-fold means 1.5% are growing. 100-fold means only 1% are growing. Because that means the 1% is doing the job of 100. You see the point? So you have to think of yourself if you're actually growing in Christ. You know, and ask God. And if you're not growing, well, it's easy enough to start. Use one John 1, 9, ask him who's your teacher, get under that teacher. Then you'll be growing. Okay? Now, if you're growing, then that means a hundred of your fellow believers around you are not. Or 60, or 30, and you don't know who they are or where they are. You can guess, you know, because it's usually easy to tell if a believer's not growing. But that's not the point of it. The point is to understand that you're where you are. God put you there. For their sake and for your sake. But it's a hierarchical arrangement. You're growing, they're not. You're the blessing, they're the cursing. To offset their cursing, you get deployed to be in their environment. So that God can justify blessing them. Because look, we Christians are like a minority in terms of like the whole world. A lot of people call themselves Christians, but they're not saved. Okay? The the believers who are saved are a minority amongst the world. And if... The believer, if you've got a lot of believers who are cursing the world because they're not growing, and a few who are blessing to the world because they are growing, that impacts everybody else who's not even a believer yet. And of course, one of the impacts is to get them, how do you want to call it, an opportunity to be around you. Because where are they going to get good information? You can't get good information from 99% of Christians. They're they're as apostate as possible. Pro-lifers are like the scumbags, all the way at the almost all the way at the bottom of the divine hierarchical you know barrel because they're spitting on Christ. They're spitting on the whole spiritual life. If you do not understand that life begins at birth, see you know born again. Hello, 
born the first time, born again. Life begins at birth, not before. When you're breathing on your own, spiritually or otherwise, that's when you're born. That's when you're alive. If they don't understand that, they don't understand the spiritual life. But you do. So God will literally, and it's, it's really hard to accept this. It's hard to accept being important. You know, every, the, the, I already covered how the sin nature wants it, and yet that's what God wants to give you. That's the irony. The sin nature is forever reaching for self-worth. It's an energizer bunny. It's like Donald Trump. He's forever t- saying, me, 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 me. Everybody loves me. Everybody loves me. Everybody loves me. That's what he wants to believe. Because he's insecure. And smart people can be, and usually are, insecure. Rich people are often insecure because their standards go up. And once these, their standards go up, they realize, you know, how standards can go down. So they're very insecure. Okay? That's not, that's not a flaw necessarily. It's just a problem that they face. Okay? Your sin nature by nature is insecure. That's why the woman took the fruit in the first place. Okay? So all these insecure people around you, believers mostly, I mean, not no, unbelievers mostly, believers secondarily, and then there's you. It's like a galaxy. Have you ever looked at a galaxy or a picture of a galaxy? There are many different shapes of galaxies, but most of them are sort of like spirals, where you got a center, where the black hole is at the center. That's sort of what anchors all the stars by, you know, sort of a gravitational pull. And it, it, it's like a pinwheel. It sort of spirals out. Not all galaxies are 100% like that. But the point is, is that that's you in the center. Haha, <laughs> you're the black hole. A black hole, one day science will discover this, and I don't know the formula to help them, but I can put it in words. A black hole is a star womb as much as it is a star grave. Okay? That's exactly what you are and what I am. Things are to birth out of us. If you're growing, that's what you are. And therefore, there's a gravitation around you. And the blessing is flowing from God to you, out to them. And therefore, He has a geographical will for your life. Where you ought to be. He has, you know, there's a job he wants you to have. There's a geography where he wants you to be placed. Any moment of any day, there's something he has that would be the highest and best way for you to use your time. And you can choose to find out what that is. And that's a learning process and you never get it right all the time. You get it right like sometimes. All right. But because you're seeking to know, because you're in the process the blessing flows out to everybody else because you need them and they need you and they're saying no to God, either believer or unbeliever, and therefore he can't justify blessing them. See, God's blessing goes where the yes is. See, you know, you're blessed to be saved, right? Why? Because you heard Jesus Christ paid for your sins and you believed it. That's a yes. It's God's work. But he doesn't do anything apart from your consent. Because that's the way he wants to do it. That's his sovereign will. I will not do anything apart from your consent. So there's a constant a constant waiting for you to consent. Okay, you're growing, so you're consenting. They're not growing, so they're not consenting. And if they're not consenting, they can't be blessed. And the same thing, of course, is true for the unbeliever. They're not consenting. Now, there's a de minimis, as it were, preservation of time and history so that everybody has the opportunity. It's like due diligence disclosure. Everybody has an opportunity to come to a yes. Because, you know, saying yes is not something you always do instantly. You have to hear something and decide it and think it over, and then you say yes. Sometimes you say yes instantly. Sometimes you never say yes. So there's time. But how does God justify that time being provided? Now, my pastor spent 50 years of time trying to figure that out. 
He finally called it Blessing by Association, and he knew there was a grant of time. He did not know how much time. And when I was, you know, trying to put, you know, into a comp- comprehensive piece, well, how much is that? How does that work? That's when over the years, you know, last 15 years or so, God's caused me to know, you know, that it's 490 plus 70 plus 490 as time grants. And then the thousand year time grant, and then the 50 is appended to it for unbelievers, and all the stuff I put in the How God Orchestrates Time playlist. And then, you know, in the last eight years, it's going to see here it is in a meter two, starting in Genesis 1, where the 1050 is noted, as it should be. Now, why am I saying all that? I'm an illustration, and you got to do with yourself what I'm doing with me, because I don't know your facts, so I can only use my own. All right? But you got to do this with your own facts. What are my facts? Well, I'm female. Who, you know, a whole lot of people think, well, you're female, you shouldn't talk about doctrine. Yeah, I agree. Except that God wants it and he makes it work. So don't go by the fact I'm female. Go by the content and ask God if you're supposed to even listen. That solves that. All right? So you take each fact about yourself and say, okay, how is God deploying that? What is God doing with that fact about your own self? So that you get a better sense of what I'm saying right now. God is deploying you around your periphery. You're the center of the galaxy. Okay? And he's deploying you. He put you there. Just like he made Satan first. Just like, you know, he put this this soul in, in the fetus that exited Mary's womb and that became the Christ. So too, he made you. That was a sovereign decision of God's. And if you're a king in training, that's also a sovereign decision of God's. There's nobody else who can make it actually occur. You have to say yes, and he does it. And he won't do it if you don't say yes. But if you are saying yes, then you're the center of the galaxy. That's how it works. For the sake of you, and more for the sake of them. At the same time, they're like your slaves. So you have to start thinking of yourself. I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. It's really hard to do this because it's like you look at yourself in the mirror and it's like, there's no king here. But you are. No matter who you are. Every one of us has this future that is God's will for our lives. And we can turn it down. And most of us do. Okay, but if you're not, then what's the mechanics of going through your daily life? Because you have to be, as it were, and that's the theme of this audio, you have to become a role model for yourself. You have to live the role. You know, remember in last increment, what's the role, what's the model? Clearly, it's not what people think. People think of role models as paragons of virtue. No. It's the system. It's you're a real person, you got all of your flaws and other things intact. That's one side of you. The other side of you is the doctrine that God's building in your head. Wheat and tares. That's the role model. That's the role model pan Bible. Everybody in the Bible got to make sure to show you the doctrine that's going in their heads. And he makes sure to show you the flaws. And each person has his own like story of the doctrine that he gets and the flaws that he has. And Paul sort of summarized the whole thing in Romans 7. You know, I believe the word is good, that's the doctrine side. But then I look at my body and I see the law of sin at work. That's the flaw side. Paul got it that he was the poster child. But so are you. And so is everybody whose story is in the Bible. You got one side, it's kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You got one side the doctrine that God's building in you. And the other side is like you apart from doctrine. And they just coexist. That's the role model. Totally antithetical to what Christianity touts. So Christianity isn't growing up. Because they don't even understand the Bible. They don't even, they can recite facts or verses. But they have no clue what those verses mean and why they're there. At all. So, if you're growing, you have to have a clue. 
first clue, or maybe not the first clue, but the one that you can use daily and need to, what kind of role model am I? Doctrine God's building in you, that'll be clear to you on a daily basis, or become clearer, and then of course there's you with your flaws. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. And so you're practicing on yourself. And you're the straw man. You're the poster boy. Just like Paul knew he was. Warts and all. You know, Paul's warts are very clear. It's just hysterical the way, you know, Luke shows up how, you know, stupid Paul was in Acts 21. Oh, I'll die for Christ. Okay. You know, and Luke closes the chapter saying we couldn't talk him out of it. So we just shut up. What do you do with somebody who's too stubborn? You can't say anything. Really cute. My pastor had a field day explaining that chapter. But that's the point. You're you. God picked you. You didn't pick you. First God caused you to be born. Now you're here. Now you get to do the picking. What are you going to pick? Okay, if you pick him, if you pick to grow, then he grows you and he deploys you. So you want to kind of like spot that. How is God deploying me? Okay, so I started with the example, female. Why would God deploy a female? That bothers me. That has bothered me from the very beginning. You know, to me, I am like classic female. Barefoot and pregnant was what I thought should be my future guess what never happened I mean well it is sort of happening but the pregnancy is for the the next life you know being parent kingship is parenting so I'm supposed to be mommy you know forever to my kingdom except that they'll it won't be you know there's no gender then but you see how hysterical that is and and everything that I've ever been in my life as a female is atypical of both my concept of what female ought to mean and, you know, women's libras would love the life I had. I'm not a liber at all. I don't believe in it at all. I think it's stupid, a waste of time, and I don't need their help. Okay? But I've lived that kind of life where everybody's always put me in some kind of profession because I guess I'm a geek or something. I don't know. But that, that's, that's the female and the life. So now you take yourself, maybe you're female too, maybe you're male, and then look at the characteristics in you. And how has God deployed you? Because he's given you a talent, he's given you a vocation, he's given you an occupation, he's given you a location. Family members, you know, all those things. Look at those things like clues to how God is deploying you. God is deploying you in a secular manner, and he's deploying you in a spiritual manner. Okay? And once you find out what that is, you can better orient to how the doctrine you're learning on a daily basis applies to your kingship. Applies to your role. So you better learn what role and what model you are. Okay? And it's going to be surprising. It's not going to... God is not politically correct. Obviously. Why would he use a female to come up with Bible Hebrew meter? The scholars have been arguing about it for 300 years. Why didn't he give it to one of them? That's been my question to him for 15 years. Okay? And I, I, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the answer. But there is one. That's the point. Okay, so now look at your own life. There's going to be something quirky about your life that's not politically correct. That he's doing in your life, like spiritually. And if he's not doing it now, he will. Because he loves doing this kind of stuff. He loves turning stuff on its head. He likes turning things upside down. You know? What was that? What were you saying? The cornerstone, the, the stumbling cornerstone, the, the stone that the builders rejected is now made the cornerstone. 
That's his kind of sense of humor. Filling all in all. What was the other one? Sterile made kids. He loves irony. In other words, there's going to be something about your spiritual deployment. Maybe you don't know it yet. Maybe you have to learn a lot of doctrine before you do. But whatever it is, there's going to be something about your spiritual deployment that's quirky like I just described for myself. Something that it shouldn't be that way. Some kind of spiritual talent he gives you. Some kind of, I don't know, role. That once you become aware of it, it's like, that shouldn't be true for me. I shouldn't have this. And you'll come up with whatever your reasons are. In other words, it's not traditional. It's not expected. It seems wrong. I don't mean wrong like immoral, but wrong like an out of place. Because that's what he does. And if you go back in the Bible, you'll notice that he, he, he does that to all the people that are mentioned in the Bible. Paul was a you know, Hebrew of the Hebrews. He stud- <laughs> Paul studied under Gamaliel. So why didn't God use Paul to be an apostle to the Jews? That's what Paul wanted. That's what he was trained for. But God rips him out and makes him an apostle of the Gentiles. And Peter, who everybody said his Greek is bad, it's not really bad, it's creative. Peter, who was kind of a a lot less skilled in the doctrines and you know Judaism. He wasn't he wasn't a slouch, but he he wasn't Paul. Paul was like Mr. Genius when it came to the Mosaic Law. And God doesn't allow Paul to be an apostle to the Jews. Instead he picks Peter, who, you know, the Jews looked down on. Okay? Peter was a Galilean. Galileans were kind of like rubes. They were regarded as rustic. Okay? I mean, he wasn't... He was a really smart man and he owned a business. But... He wasn't respected. And so God took someone not respected and made him an apostle to the Jews. Okay? Which is hysterical because the Catholics missed this. And then took Paul, who was respected by the Jews, that's one reason they were so upset that he converted, and took him away from the Jews and sent him out to the Gentiles who wouldn't be respecting him. See, that's what I mean by out of place. The same thing with Moses. Moses was found in the water and made to grow up to be the next pharaoh. It was a political move by Hatshepsut. It's a long story. Okay? So, wouldn't the normal, right method for God to deliver his people be to get Moses to be Pharaoh and then free the Israelites that way? That You know, any normal one of us would thought, oh, okay, that's what God's going to do. But that isn't what God did, is it? Okay? And so what happens is Moses ends up having to leave and then he twirls around the wilderness for 40 years. And then his brother has to come pick him up because Moses doesn't want to talk. He was one of the most eloquent men who ever lived and he doesn't want to talk. So, you know, God appoints Aaron instead. And then even then, Aaron's the brother of Moses. But God appoints Aaron separate. See, separation of church and state right there. Aaron separately priest, not Moses. Moses is the head of the civil government. So it's two brothers, same father, Koath. And father Koath is moved to the head of the line. It's a long story there too. And psh, separation. You wouldn't expect that. Because all the world at the time, united church and state, God separated it. See, this is the kind of thing he does. So now when you go back to your own life, it's like, what is quirky about my secular life? Because there might be something there. What is quirky about especially my spiritual assignment that helps me train as king? 
that way you can find out what role and what model you are. Now, no matter what role and what model you are, you're going to have trouble dealing with the fact that you're important. You have to do this. It's not... It's, it's something that if you really were born into a secular royal family, they would do this to you. If you were born a prince in any of the royal houses, say, of Europe, from the minute you're born, they drill it into you. You're a prince, you're a prince, you're a prince, you're a prince. Therefore, you can do this and you can't do that. You can think this, you can't think that. You have to stand and sit in a certain way. You have to follow this procedure. You have to follow that procedure because you're a prince, because you're a prince, because you're a prince, because you're a prince. Well, you have to kind of learn how to do that to yourself. Ask God to remind you. You have to walk around all day because, you know, it just seems so silly. I'm a king. Yes, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. I'm cutting onions, but I'm a king. My eyes are watering because I didn't turn on the water while I cut the onions, but I'm a king. I'm going to the bathroom, but I'm a king. It sounds hysterically stupid to say that. But it's God's plan for every believer's life. And most of the believers are going to say no. So that leaves very few kings left. And here's the most important thing I wanted to say about it and that kind of started this audio. In my pastor's final years, from 1997 until 2003, he realized that the United States was too, the Christians were too far gone, that especially because of the pro-lifers, okay, because they are so anti-Bible, you know. They, they they turn God into a murderer by saying that, you know, abortion is murder. They spit on God every chance they get. They insult him every chance they get. And every chance they get, they try to give to Caesar what belongs to God. Okay? And he realized that the pro-lifers were so infecting America that he wasn't even sure America was going to continue as a nation. So starting in about 1997... Okay, I heard him say it then anyway. He might have started saying it sooner. But starting in about 1997, he started to say he didn't think that the the U.S. would possibly last, but maybe another 40 years. And, you know, it's an estimate. You know, there's none of that stupid, Oh, I had a revelation from God. No, you use Bible doctrine and that's your intelligence. You use that to analyze everything. Okay. That's how God uses the revelation from God. Not some appearance. The Virgin Mary appeared to me and said. Nothing like that crap. Okay. So, he started saying, you know what? We're so apostate now that I don't even think there's like 5 or 10% growing Christians in the United States. So, then he was trying to figure out why we were still alive as a nation. And this starts, you can hear him do it yourself, in Lesson 1095 of 1992 Spiritual Dynamics Series, what was it? 376 um, at rbtheme.org. You can just start ordering from Lesson 1095 forward. You might want to start at 1054 to get the context. To see his process of discovery and what he was, he was asking, God, you know, how come we're still here when we're so apostate? Why didn't you wipe us out? Because you, you, you know, Israel was wiped out for less. Okay, they weren't as far gone as far as he was concerned. So that's when he started going back to Scripture. And was like, why are we still here? And he started to realize, oh, wait a minute. There's a, another, like, standing in the gap, maturation believer doctrine in the Bible that he termed Jeshurun. And you can search on that in the English. That's how they translate it to. It it comes from Yasher, and it means upright. Okay? And a lot of the Jews will tell you that that means righteous, and it, it's true. But the Jews don't understand righteousness, the, the use of the term Yasher and righteousness in the Bible. They think it's works. But it's referring to God's righteousness that's imputed to you the minute you believe in Messiah. 
Of course, they don't, most of them don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So they don't understand that. So when it's talking about Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account as righteousness. So that every word righteous in the Old Testament is referring to a believer. They don't get that. Okay, so the upgrade on that is that the righteousness that you're imputed with the minute you believe which is juridical, gets filled up with Bible doctrine that makes your thinking righteous. Now, righteous means, I don't want to put it, it's so different from what Christians say. Righteous really means um, like God's. See, everybody is so hung up on self-worth. They're thinking righteous means no sin and good and you should be, you know, um, patted on the back. Okay? Oh, I'm righteous. It's not like that at all. How do I, how do I want to explain it? Something that's really gorgeous and right. Right plus gorgeous. Righteous. Right, gorgeous. So you cut off gorge and you get righteous. It's something gorgeously right. Like when you walk out in, on some mornings and you happen to be at the sunrise and oh, the sky is just so gorgeous. And the beauty of it is it's right. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it being gorgeous. That's righteous. Gorgeously right. You know, like when, I, we've all had moments like that. Your car is just washed and it's coming out of the, the car wash, you know. And it's just so, ah. Oh. You haven't seen your car look that good in ages. And you, and you, you know, you take your, your um, elbow, you, you put your hand in a fist, you put it above your arm, and then you... Quickly move your elbow down in front of you, both of them. Yes! That is righteous. You know, you, you get the, you're playing basketball and you weren't really sure, but you throw the ball and it just angles exactly right and goes straight into the basket. Yes! That's righteous. You're playing racquetball, and you aim to get a kill shot, but you didn't think you'd make it, and it manages to just exactly be so perfect it's a rollout. Yes! That's righteous. Very different from what Christians expect. It's right, and it's gorgeous, all at the same time. That's the way God fills you up with doctrine. You fall in love with the meaning of doctrine. This is why God doesn't sin. The truth that he created is gorgeously right. Yes! Okay? And he's filling you up and filling you up and filling you up with that. And you fall in love with it. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. Oh, yeah, the law. Oh, it's so gorgeous and right and true. And then I look at my body and I see that I'm disobeying it. What the heck is going on here? That kind of stuff. Okay, God is filling you up with his thinking. And you end up, it, it ends up, you know, fitting together after a while. And you fall in love with it. You fall in love with it. Now, as a result of that, you want to use it. And as a result of that, you start, it's like, I don't want to live if I can't use doctrine. Okay, I got to go to the bathroom. Can I use doctrine somehow to go to the bathroom? Just so that you can really use the doctrine. Because otherwise it's too boring to go to the bathroom. And then you start to understand... Oh, that's why it's okay for God to watch me go to the bathroom. There's some kind of doctrine that he's baptized unto it. And he's going, yes! 
so it's not it's not boring it's not too low it's not wrong it's not a waste of his time or yours because he's baptized it with some kind of doctrinal meaning and the doctrinal meaning is gorgeously right now as that starts to happen to you you'll still sin but your standards change your ideas of what you want out of life and everything else changes and again you're the center of the galaxy and it's the attractions of life completely like reverse okay they do so now you look at kingship as an opportunity to apply doctrine everywhere so when you say to yourself I'm a king I'm a king I'm a king I'm a king well but that's the doctrine and at first it feels really awkward and stupid and totally wrong but it's not and the objective of it being true is so that a you know what it's like for Christ to be Christ you know we share all he is and has that's literally true second so that you can understand like how he did it because he's the ultimate poster boy how did he do it how did he stay sinless and it's not even really about sin it's why why do you want to go through this what was it like for him seeing through his eyes is the way I like to put it well that's gorgeously right it's certainly gorgeous and the good news is by the way you know because we usually equate something pleasurable with being oh I shouldn't have this oh yeah you should so it's not just right I ought to do this it's right and, oh wow thank you God okay like that you become happier and at the same time your standard of living goes up in your head and at the same time everything around you you get this you end up seeing it for how ugly it is and at the same time everybody's being blessed because you're being trained as a king and you have to think of yourself as a king because everybody needs to see that they need to see it they don't know that's what they're seeing but they need to see it because you're getting happier even when I don't know how to explain it even when you realize that life is much worse than you thought you're being stretched now the really important thing about that is then you're seeing what role and what model God is using you for in that moment not merely as a policy not merely as a goal not merely as a set of ideas that you're not even sure are true but in the moment because it's supposed to flow like that it's the, the bi-directional feedback between God and you between the Holy Spirit and you as you've seen happen to me in these audios he hits me with something that's the way it's supposed to be all the time because that's gorgeous rightness the gorgeous rightness of intimate relationship with him it's supposed to be like that for everybody but until you got enough doctrine in you it's like a factory that hasn't been built and the factory has to first be built before it can become operational once the factory as it were of all the doctrinal pieces is built then it becomes operational and when I say all just you know I don't mean all the doctrine that's in the Bible and every word in the Bible I mean the lines okay a factory has got walls a factory has got pipes a factory has got you know um, what do you call it the the machinery all right when all that's built then the factory you can turn it on and produce your widgets or whatever all right there's always going to be some maintenance there's always going to be some part of it yet to build but you have to have a certain amount of it already completed before you can turn the switch on and the factory runs the same thing is true for doctrine in your head now when that happens 
the gorgeous rightness of it is what carries you. Getting to the phase where it's going to turn on every single day. And of course when you sin it turns off. That's a battle. Understanding that that's the goal of course is what most Christians don't even do. So you're battling to get the factory built. And then once, how do you want to put this? Once you start to realize that it's being built, then there's this big shock on the king. And it's really hard to live with that. So you have to keep telling yourself. And that's, you know, because one of the sins that you'll sin that turns the factory off is to, is to think that you're being arrogant to say that. You're arrogant if you don't. We're bride of Christ, not peasants. You don't owe anybody an explanation. You are to be prepared if they ask you questions. But you're not there to sell them on God. Okay? It's really important. The people who knock on doors and talk about their soul winning and try to run out and convince everybody to share the gospel. That's the most peasantly, peasant disgusting thing you can do. You get prepared. God will lead them to you. Again, galaxy principle. You're the center of the galaxy. They come to you. That's to highlight the fact that you're in training to be a king. They don't know that. But that God knows that. He's setting up the factory. He's setting up not just your factory, but the factories that they're going to be, as it were, in, in the future. A factory of thinking. A factory of relationship. And for all you know, the people you interface with down here will actually be your subjects in the eternal state. I'll give you pause about how to relate to them. And so every single day and every single thought and every single activity is like, what's the eternal state application to what I'm doing now? How is this a paradigm of something in the eternal state? How is this a paradigm of kingship? And, and if you keep on doing that, what you're really doing, and it's really quite um, prosaic in a way, is you're going through the same kind of training process. Except it's for the eter eternity and it's a spiritual level. You're going through the same kind of training process that any secular royalty has to go through. Except you're determining the rules. Romans 13 through 15, your royal family, you make the rules. When you're growing up in a secular royal family, they make the rules and they inculcate you with the rules. Well, the only rules you get inculcated with in the spiritual life is Bible itself. And then you have to take the Bible itself and turn it into, as it were, a set of rules that you live by. See, you're the role model to yourself. Then you become a good king. If you can rule yourself, then you can rule someone else. Okay, so during my day... And I'm not doing this the way I should, okay? Constant problem with the practice. If someone writes me an email, if someone makes a comment, if someone says this or does that, I'm supposed to, do I just sit back and listen and I don't listen enough? Do I talk? And if I talk, what way should I talk? What is it that the other person needs? What kind of practice am I supposed to get out of this exchange with somebody else? You see that? What that does is that, like James, thank you, he just threw that at me. Like James said, that makes you quick to hear, slow to speak. Big failing of mine, I'm the reverse. And the worst part about it is I actually know what the person means. So I don't listen anymore to save time. That's bad. Bad habit. I have to practice listening and then wait to speak, even though I know the answer immediately. 
because the king has to you know weigh things the same thing with you you'll be in some cases you'll already be quick to hear slow to speak in other cases you'll just want to talk right away okay and and he'll tell you'll know from him slow down wait for the other person yes you already know what the person's going to say yes you already know the answer you wait they need the space for them to express themselves and talk that teaches patience you get the drift of this you get to the point where online in real time every moment of the day whether you're washing dishes or in a phone conversation you know what you hear it's not physical hearing he he lets you know what he wants. He lets you know what the le- what the lesson is. Okay? Because he really is your mentor. There's always spirit doing it. He really is your mentor. You really are Telemachus. And he's really showing you, hi, this is what you do. He's advising you. Real time, immediate. So you know better what it was like for Christ. What he did to Christ is what he does to us. And the beauty of this, the yes, the gorgeous rightness of it, is you get to know it's him talking. And that, that colors everything. In other words, there's no such thing as this horizontal life anymore. He uses all of it. It chopping onions there's a lesson in chopping onions there's a lesson in watching a video there's a lesson in going to the bathroom there's a lesson in dusting well then there's no such thing as demeaning anymore there's no such thing as menial anymore everything is as it were a shadow or a really the right word is paradigm it's a structure that beneath what it looks like on the surface is some kind of teaching mechanism he can use and he will and you get to the place where you know he i mean it's, it's not physical hearing but you he, he he lets you know what he wants he lets you know what it's for you're getting instruction and the bible is tied with it but it's actual instruction applicable to you directly in what you're doing So then you're having, as it were, a conversation. So now you know what it was like for Christ. I mean, everybody's always talking about, where's the proof of God? Yeah, well, it's designed to be bi-directional feedback 24-7. But you know what? Until you learn the language, you can't tell. What's the language? Bible doctrine. Use 1 John 1 9. Ask God who is your teacher. He'll make sure you know within 30 days. And once you know, if you say no, he will punish you big time. Then you'll know a little bit about how God communicates. Okay, I got that much. Okay, so I sit under my pastor and I learn all these things that don't make any sense to me. But I keep at it, I keep at it. And I pray and I don't seem to get any answer. And blah, 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 blah. But you keep at it because you want to. And little by little, poco a poco se va lejos. You're going to get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And it's going to add up. And you're going to know. It's a real shock once you start realizing you know that God is communicating with you. He sends you ideas. And by the way, so do the demon boys. So you have to test every idea you get with whether or not it fits the Bible. Because the demon boys like to pretend that they're God too. And they send you all kinds of ideas. Just look at the presidential election. That was even one of the questions in the first debate. What did God tell you about the election? It was an ending question in the debate, just before the closing remarks. You know, how do you know it's God giving you the information? And I'm asserting, and yes, it's true, 
God communicates with you, no doubt about it. So what, you think the other boys on the other side are not going to pretend to be him? Sure they will. Which means that as a ruler, you get to test it with what doctrine you know. Was that God talking to me, or my dinner, or a demon boy, or a hallucination, or wishful thinking? Good question. Well, what doctrine do you know that you can apply to what you think it might have been from God and test it? That's ruling. And when you get the right answer, you'll know. So you do that day in, day in, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day in, day out, like practicing piano. And it's really kind of boring at times. Until you've done it a lot. Then it becomes second nature, like brushing your teeth. And you start dreaming about it. And you do it in your sleep. And then you're, then you will realize, oh, I'm growing. And it's gorgeously right. So you don't want to live without it. And it hurts too. All at once, see? Omniscience, everything at once. He's training you in that also. So now you're your own role model. Training how to function. In what role? Well, a role that you're gradually learning. Is what model? Well, the model that you're also gradually learning. And that's important because you have to end up knowing, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. So that you can craft your role model. For the sake of your kingdom. In eternity. Because you're going to be like Christ in eternity. And like Christ, all you're ever going to want to do for all of eternity is throw yourself down for the sake of your people. You own them. And they want you to own them. And I don't know how much you're aware of it, but this is true even now. Whatever you own, owns you. Peace out.